getting started in their career. Um, maybe you know they've got that first job out of college. So perhaps for the first time in their life, they've got a little bit of extra money. What, what would you recommend for someone in, in that situation in terms of how they approach, uh, you know, in, invest in their money and, and presumably looking toward the future? Who are you? And where are you going? What do you want? Together we'll find the ideal path on The Way to Wow Show with your host, Kevin Bemmel. If you're going to invest, it's best to have a philosophy. Rather than just buying or selling on hunches willy-nilly, when you have a plan, you can invest according to that plan. Dmitry Farbarov is going to talk to us about how to develop that investment philosophy. But first, we're going to talk to Diane Quinones, and she's going to make a cocktail for us. And I'm thinking it's going to be mescal. Mescal, oh, you know yes. it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> how are you doing? <laughs> Good. Um, how did you know? Uh, yes, Because you're of the course. mescal exactly. lady. So the, whole, the... The, whole, the whole production is the mescal lady <laughs> is coming. The mescal lady coming? <laughs> uh, yes, we cover mescal. We talk about tequila and uh, mescal as agave spirits. So today I'm making a cocktail that I'm very excited to show you guys. It's the espresso martini. So this oh. is very, very popular. It's having a resurgence. Uh -huh. um, typically done with vodka base, but we're gonna do a mezcal base today. Just okay. to kind of play around with it and um, just show some nuance. And this is going to, we're gonna make two of these, right? Uh, yes, well, you know, and then you'll have to make some on the side for the, <laughs> the team to keep them happy. Absolutely. We don't want, you know, rebellion. I, I, I'll be the... at cocktail partying all, all, <laughs> all afternoon. Oh, good. Here for the long haul. <laughs> so we're going to do an ounce and a half of the mezcal. Okay. We will add a half an ounce of, of the coffee liqueur here. This is really beautiful um, Caribbean coffee liqueur. Mm -hmm. So. And that's for each cocktail, right? For each cocktail, okay. correct. So half an ounce. <laughs> of a coffee liqueur. It could be anything, so if you have a Starbucks one, you can use that, or Mr. Black, or any of the newer ones you'll see. Okay. Um, and then we're gonna use one ounce of fresh pressed espresso. So this is oh. very important. You could use coffee, it's a, it's a trick to do something different, but you wanna use espresso because it's gonna have that punch and that power. So oh. you want one ounce of espresso for each drink. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna keep you up And I guess the, 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 I was gonna say the caffeine will <laughs> The we'll caffeine get will get you going, yes, right. exactly. And then we're just going to add a little bit of simple syrup. The coffee liqueur already is a little bit sweet. Right. So you're just going to add just a hair of um, simple syrup, about a quarter ounce for each one. Okay. So we'll put two in there. And then that's it. And then the secret to this is the shaking. Oh, because okay. the sugar and the coffee liqueur are going to mix together, and they're going to become frothy, and it's going to whip, almost whip together. Oh, okay. Yeah, so you'll see the texture is very important here. So this is this is a little bit like an ice blended mocha without the blending. Exactly. Like so yes, it's gonna be like a frappuccino. So you'll definitely have to really shake it hard. You want the frothiness to come into oh, the okay. shaker. You want to see uh -huh. this it's hard to hold because it's so cold. Absolutely. Oh, all right. This is this is like you know you can have the margarita blended or you can have yes. it what straight up and this is all of the ice is doing the blending here for you so that's going to create the texture like I said before and the also, the other important thing is that that fresh espresso is going to create that texture mm -hmm. okay. so you'll see oh yeah wow there's no cream or anything but just that shaking with the sugar and the mm -hmm. fresh espresso will give you that beautiful frothiness oh and it's actually there's a head on it oh yeah yeah wow. Voila, espresso martini. Yeah, can't wait. And if you notice, it should almost cascade like that Guinness. Oh, yeah, it is. Almost like a Guinness. It goes from, yeah, yeah, from very light yeah, to Yeah, so it'll go light to dark, and then it'll change as you drink it. So oh. there you are. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> So Deanne, mix this up. I think you will like this. All right. You gonna you smell the coffee in it? Mm. Perfect. 
Wow. Nice way. Fantastic. Huh? Nice. Yeah. Great coffee flavor. Just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there was a time when you came home from work and that, well, you probably weren't greeted with something quite this fancy, but at least a martini. Yeah. So I'm going I'm to read a little uh, biography of you here. Dmitry Farberov is a uh, decided underachiever. He graduated cum laude from UCLA and earned both the Charter Financial Analyst and the Chartered Financial Planner designations. I, I should say, my mother is, has a um, uh, certifi certified financial planner designation. It was a load of work, and I understand the chartered designations are even more uh, work than that. So, wow. Um, at Miracle Mile Investors, which is a registered investment advisor with over $2 billion under management, Dimitri personally manages about $80 million for in individuals and institutions, including a mixed martial arts champion, the producers of the most popular show on Netflix, and entrepreneurs and founders of some of the most successful businesses in Los Angeles. Over the decades, I've met... I don't know how many stockbrokers, financial advisors, wealth managers. What sets you apart from the thousands and thousands of these guys is that you have a philosophy that undergirds your practice. And that's, that's really where I'd like to start is, is talking about this investing philosophy because I think that's where a lot of people go wrong. So, so talk to us about that, if you would. Sure. I would say investing is very hard. And people think that investing is easy, depending on when they come into the cycle of, of the general markets. Uh, they, they think they can just ride a wave and, and, and make a lot of money. But countless mistakes over 20 plus years in my life has taught me that philosophy is critical to having long-term success in the markets. Right? Warren Buffett has a philosophy, which means he doesn't flinch when markets turn against him because he knows that his philosophy is what's going to be, uh, it's going to be standing after all the volatility is done. Most people don't have a philosophy. They defer to others to help them determine what that philosophy is. They, they focus on the next hot stock or the next hot sector. But when volatility comes into play and when blood is on the streets and when they, they, they turn on the TV or read the newspaper and it says, sell because X is going to happen in the world and, and, and you see your portfolio down 10, 20, 30 percent and that could be countless hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars in my world, that changes people. People don't know how they're going to react under those circumstances and so that's where for me in my personal investing uh, has, I, I've learned to, to really understand what my core philosophy is, right? It's only when times are really hard that we understand kind of what makes us tick. And I, I've learned that through, through all the volatility in the markets over the last two decades, whether the great financial crisis or the corona crisis or any, any, any periods of volatility in between, clients that don't have a philosophy will fail. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten. And that's where, that's where having an advisor is so valuable who does have a philosophy. But it's important to find that advisor who helps educate you about what your philosophy ought to be, helps un understands what your psychology is um, that will really determine how you react to in, in times of stress. So every philosophy, every individual is different. There are going to be folks that have a philosophy of momentum. There are, the, there are going to be folks that have a value philosophy. They want to, they want to be the contrarian. They want to do what, what folks are not doing. They want to invest away from the herd. Some have to be a part of the herd. And so that's where it's critical. I think that's what differentiates the quality advisor and the successful investor from that individual who's going to make the mistake that's going to make the difference in, in long-term returns over time. So let, let's take someone who, let's say, is, is just getting started in their career. Um, maybe, you know, they've got that first job out of college. So perhaps for the first time in their life, They've got a little bit of extra money. They can, you know, go on a big vacation. They can, you know, spend it on this, or they could, you know, start in investing some money. So, um, what what would you recommend for someone in in that situation in terms of how they approach, uh, you know, 
in, investing their money and, and presumably looking toward the future. Maybe they're not married yet, but you know, hope, hope to get married and, and have a family, all that kind right. of stuff. Right. Well, first and foremost, that individual, their number one investment is, is in herself or himself. I think that's that's the key. That's that's going to be the biggest return of, on on principal or on invested capital will be the investment that they make in themselves, their education, and so on. But assuming they have a career and they have they have ample income and to to pay for the day to day and they have savings, at that point the value is not in the underlying investment itself, but it's in the process with which someone approaches in, in investing for the long run, which is save. Save as much as you possibly can. And, and, and when you have money to save, do it consistently. And then at that point, the question is, what savings, what investment is going to get you the best return on, on, on your principal over time? And that, and, and that it's a question of diversification. Uh, that's where philosophy is also important, because diversification is not going to bring uh, riches overnight. Diversification is going to bring riches over 30 plus years. But if your philosophy is one that's not going to be satisfied with slow, slow uh, returns and, and, and wealth that's going to be accumulated over a very long period of time, then you have to know that in advance mm -hmm. and, then, and then find the strategy that makes sense for you. So that might be uh, investing in angel investing. As, just as an example, it's more aggressive, but that's going to have a different return uh, characteristic than a diversified stock and bond portfolio. So that's where philosophy is a critical element of things. Um, but in general, I think to get started, you have to just understand how to react to volatility, which is inev inevitable in any part of our lives. So that's where I tell anybody, get started in the market. Diversify portfolio. To, to one individual might be boring, but to someone who's never experienced any volatility, seeing a 5-10% decline in any amount of capital is significant and will cause you to lose sleep. So get used to that. And then over time, you can diverse, diversify into other investments that have a different risk profile. So how does one determine whether his, his philosophy is is valid or he's made a mistake and actually does need to you know readjust his portfolio or or you know change his outlook how 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 do you, how does one determine that right well that that depends on a number of factors the first is are they doing it on their own or are they investing with alongside somebody else an advisor and and i think that that's a critical element if, if, you, if you own a bad individual investment and the market turns away against you, you should be able to cut your losses and, and, and leave. But you need to know what makes a bad investment, what makes a good investment. And, and most people don't even ask those questions. Like, when are you willing to exit your investment? If you have a long-term horizon and you've got a diversified portfolio, like in, in, your, in, in your case, you know that any volatility will be short-lived. It might be a couple of months, days, or years, potentially. But it'll, in the grand scheme of things, will be short-lived. But if you have a, one, one stock that you own, I know folks that have millions of dollars in Tesla, right? Mm -hmm. How do you know if Tesla's a quality investment? It's a great car, right? It's a great product, great CEO, but it, it's, it's an investment that can drop and has dropped 40%. And, and potentially, if we look back th three years ago, was on the verge of bankruptcy if stars didn't align in, in the right way now. Uh, Elon looks like a genius and the company is great, but several years ago that wasn't the case. So I, I think it's, it's about knowing what you're, why you're investing, how long you're investing, and what the eventual outcome that you want to get accomplished. If, again, if you're, if you're investing in a single company versus a collection of companies based on uh, global macro trends in, in general economy. And we know that you look back over the last hundred thousands of years, human progress is forward. And therefore, the companies that participate in that human progress, if you're diversified in all of them across different asset classes, different geographic regions, you'll be fine. Uh, but that's, that's a philosophy, right? That's, mm -hmm. um, I'm investing in the long-term growth of society. Mm -hmm. I want to participate in that. 
as opposed to a speculation on one stock or one, one sector that you believe will do well, robotics as an example. Well, what if trends move away from that direction? How do you know? You have to answer those questions before you come into that investment. And if you don't, if you don't have those answers, then you're speculating and you will make mistakes without a doubt. So, I mean, it's interesting, of all things, you brought up robotics. I, I would think that today um, it, it, it's virtually a given that something like robotics is going to grow and, and become ever more a part of not just uh, American business or worldwide business, but even here in the home, you have, you know, robotic vacuum cleaners and you've got, I don't know, you've got Alexa and, and all these things where, you know, I, don't, I guess there's not one where you can say, mix me a martini, Alexa, you know, but maybe, maybe there will be soon. So what determines or what kind of um, information guidelines should we be looking for as we, you know, size up those, so, you know, because even within a macro strategy, we still have to make individual investment decisions, right? I still have to decide whether I'm going to buy, you know, uh, Procter and Gamble, or whether I'm going to buy, you know, Apple. So, where do I? What 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 kind of guidelines should I be looking for there? Well, I I, I think I think there a big factor is how are you investing? If you're buying individual companies, what? How are you approaching? Understanding their their balance sheet. Are you, are you buying their balance sheet for future growth? Are you buying it for value relative to more expensive competitors? Uh, and, and, and so, so there, most people don't invest based on balance sheet analysis like years ago, like Warren Buffett does or ha has done. Most people invest in trends. And, and so that's, that's critical. For example, my clients, they won't know that. I mean, they, everyone knows Apple, but they won't know the difference between Teladoc and uh, I don't know uh, Siemens, right? Um, but yet they participate in that growth. Other individuals, they gravitate toward individual stocks that they want to own, and and those individuals need to be able to identify markers for success. So if you're buying based on future cash flow, uh, if you're analyzing current cash flow and you're discounting it based on certain interest rates, then you have to un understand what factors might change that might change the investment thesis if it's interest rates. So for example, the NASDAQ, and we're going to get just a little bit wonky here, sure. but, but the NASDAQ is, is largely, not largely, but a uh, big majority of the name, names right now are growth names. They're not necessarily creating uh, cash flow uh, and, and revenue to the, to the investor. Their focus is on growth and reinvesting their earnings over time. So therefore, their future earnings are dependent upon interest rates. So as interest rates go up, the, va the value of Google, for example, is, is lower if interest rates go higher uh, because they're not paying cash flow to, to the investor. Whereas, the, so, that, so there's a shift currently, for example, going from certain growth names with the expected rise in interest rates to, to more income names. And, and, and so knowing why you invested in Google uh, is, is critical, or in your case, Procter & Gamble, it's critical to know, is, are you investing, because there are a lot of factors that play into a return profile. The reality is, these days, most of the return profile is tied to the sector, not to the underlying company. So Procter & Gamble will do more or less as well as Johnson & Johnson, or whatever companies are in, this, in, are in the space. But if there's an underlying reason why you like Procter & Gamble over, over the competition, you want to make sure that those factors continue staying in place and perhaps improving. Are they starting to, do you have a better CEO? Do you have, uh, is it market share that you're buying for? And therefore, you're looking for market share. But other than that, if you're not looking for, so if, are you doing bottom-up analysis? Are you doing economic top-down analysis. And so there are so many different factors. But the key is, know why you got into the investment in the first place. And so my clients, they could care less about the individual names because they're buying the overall trends. There are other investors on Robinhood, right? So a lot of the younger audience that, that you have might not be, they're not analyzing the company's cash flow, but they like, they 
for some reason, the, that audience has gravitated towards Robinhood. They've gravitated towards crypto and, and Tesla and those names. Th these, are, these are momentum investors. That's their personality. For whatever reason, they're attracted to it. And others will say, I can't stand crypto. I don't understand it. I don't want to have anything to do with it. These are the individuals most likely that are more value-oriented individuals, contrarian. And knowing what your gut tells you at these levels is, is very often an indicator of where you're going to naturally gravitate to and then how you invest. But the key is you got to study. You have to, I mean, it's a, it's a process. People think investing is so easy. And it's, it's probably the hardest thing one can do uh, over time because human psychology is barely, nearly impossible to, to really it's a, it's a life it's a life's journey, right? To really understand that psychology. Oh, so um, I, I've got about ten questions I want to ask you, but I, I have quite time for only one more quick question. For someone who wants to get started on, on their investing journey, what's what what would you recommend as being the first thing they should do? I would say pick up a book on psychology. I, the, the, the one that comes to mind is, is Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, it's, it's just really understanding your perception of the world. And, and, and that, that's critical. Of course, it's, it's important to have an understanding of, of money, just the very basics of money. And uh, there, there are a lot of great books about uh, the basics of money. Mm -hmm. um, but knowing the basics of money is not enough. You have to know what pitfalls you're going to face. And that, the only way to do that is really understanding your own uh, elements of fear and greed and, and, and how you're going to react under those circumstances. Say, say the name of the book again. So Thinking Fast and Slow by Danny Kahneman okay. is, is probably my favorite book in, because it's so applicable to uh, any, any facet of life. Excellent. Dimitri, thank you so much for coming and talking with us today. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. So that's our show for this week, folks. I, I, after the interview, I told Dimitri, he's just the kind of person I think is ideal for managing investments. Unflappable. I've known him for quite a while, and I tried to even throw a curveball at him just took it right in stride. So I think we can literally take Dimitri's advice to the bank. Especially his, his tip on how to get started, the book by Daniel Kahneman, a Nobel Prize winner, Thinking Fast and Slow. I, I honestly haven't read it. I'm going to pick up a copy because I'm always interested in, in resources that can help me better understand how we as human beings think and act. Send us a, a, a message at, at our website, thewaytowowshow.com. Tell us what you think about our guests, what you're getting out of it, what you'd like to see. We're always interested to hear your input. Courage at all times, my friends. Marie, you're still my bell, darling.